Well, thank you. I'm delighted to be with you. Um, as Evan says, I've been thinking about the love commands, wondering about their implications for various um, matters, moral, and have just really started thinking about their implications for matters uh, having to do with immigration. And so I um, want to run some ideas by you, and we'll see what you think. <clears throat> So, uh, living in Europe um, during the time of the Holocaust um, were millions of Jews uh, um, and approximately six million were killed in the Holocaust. Um, the number of non-Jews living in Nazi-controlled areas during that time was about 300 million. And the number of those who tried to help their Jewish neighbors and friends uh, survive the Holocaust was minuscule. Uh, by conservative estimates, about 100,000, maybe 100,000, uh, if that number. Um, but far less than one-tenth of one percent uh, um, took concrete steps to help their Jewish uh, friends and neighbors survive the Holocaust. And now the question is why? Why such small numbers? Um, why not more? And no doubt the reasons are complicated, but um, an important part of the story would be, I think, that we human beings are subject at the drop of a hat to groupthink, um, to thinking something is so because everyone thinks it's so. And um, Europeans at that time had embraced in shockingly large numbers of um, violent and hate-filled anti-Semitism that made it easy to regard their Jewish neighbors as something less than human. And so Europeans at the time fell into um, a kind of systemic moral blindness, a blindness to egregiously wrong treatment of the members of, in this case, um, uh, the population of, of uh, people of Jewish descent, owing at least partly to the fact that the treatment in question was so utterly normal. Everyone did it, everyone accepted it, and it made it um, easy to fall into thinking in that way. And so, um, other cases of systemic moral blindness come to mind besides the violent anti-Semitism in Europe and the Americas. Of course, there was the chattel slavery in the Americas of the 16th through the 19th centuries, the post-Civil War Jim Crow era, and um, other uh, examples come to mind. And what I wonder about is this, um, are we in the grip of syst systemic moral blindness? And, um, about what? Of course, it's hard to see what, what uh, we're blind to if indeed we are in the grip of systemic moral blindness. But I've come to suspect um, that we are in the grip of such blindness um, when it comes to our immigration enforcement practices. And so uh, let me try to motivate this uh, concern with a parable. Now this I uh, adapt from uh, some writing on immigration ethics by the University of Colorado philosopher Michael Humer, uh, whose writing I appreciate, and, and so here's the parable. Uh, Marvin's crops have failed and his family is facing starvation, so he loads his handmade furniture into his truck and drives 200 miles to the nearest town to sell his wares at the town's marketplace. Sam, a regular at the marketplace, notices the stranger setting up his booth and inquires about it. On learning that Marvin will be selling furniture, Sam is upset. Sam's sons sell furniture in the marketplace, and Sam is worried that Marvin's booth will take away business from his sons. So he decides to act. Shotguns in hand, he and his sons confiscate Marvin's furniture and detain him in their basement for several months before dropping him off thousands of miles away from his home. Marvin eventually makes it home to discover that his family has starved. Now most of us, I take it, would think that um, Sam's behavior is morally egregious and different ethical uh, systems would give different answers to the question why. From the standpoint of a love ethic rooted in Jesus' love teachings, I think it's, uh, there's a fairly simple answer to the question what um, went wrong in Sam's treatment of Marvin and it was that Sam's treatment constitutes an egregious violation of the love neighbor command. It's a, it's a uh, textbook case of failing to love one's neighbor as one, love, uh, as one loves oneself. 
And so I want to think a little bit with you now about the love neighbor command and uh, look a little, more, a, a little more closely at what, what it is, what it involves. So love your neighbor as yourself. Now, uh, it's, it's not just a straightforward matter to interpret uh, um, biblical teaching on um, the love neighbor command. And so I, I don't have time to uh, argue much for my interpretation. I'll just put forward uh, to you how I am inclined to read the command. Um, there are three parts to it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And so the thing to start with is the question, what kind of love is at issue, is at issue here? Uh, agape uh, is the uh, uh, Greek word, but knowing the Greek, that that's the Greek word doesn't really tell us much. What is agape? I follow um, uh, the Christian philosopher, um, one of my uh, uh, philosophical mentors, uh, Nicholas Wolterstorff, in thinking that New Testament agape has two parts to it. Um, uh, what Wolterstorff calls an attraction love component and a benevolence love component. Attraction love is the love you have something uh, for something when you're attracted to it, you're drawn to it, you're in its grip. Something beautiful about it has drawn you in. And I think agape has an element of attraction. It enjoins us to appreciate or stand in awe of the neighbor's enormous worth or dignity as one beloved by God, as one created in um, God's image. And so agape is about standing in awe of or having enormous appreciation for the worth or beauty of the neighbor who is beloved by our Abba. And then there's benevolence love, which is about seeking the good, the flourishing, the well-being of the beloved. And um, uh, there one must ask the question, what is the kind of good at issue? If I'm to seek your good, what is your good? And here I can just uh, uh, only assert that as I read biblical teaching on love, um, you have to trace it back to its original context in Leviticus. And there what's going on, I think, is that the commandment to love your neighbor as yourself is a commandment to seek your neighbor's inclusion in shalom community. Shalom community, that beautiful community described throughout Hebrew scripture where the picture is uh, that all, uh, um, all have their sustenance needs met. All are safe against harms. All are treated with dignity. And so the benevolence love component of the love command is, I think, um, an injunction to seek the neighbor's shalom, his sustenance, his security, his dignity. Now, who's your neighbor? And here I just suggest that as I read the parable of the Good Samaritan, the point is your neighbor is anyone in need and in reach of your care. Your neighbor is anyone in need. Doesn't matter what, whether this person is in a different ethnic group, whether this person is in a different religious group, whether this person is in a different racial group, none of that matters. Your neighbor is anyone in need and in reach of your care. And then as yourself, what is it to love your neighbor as yourself? And here I'll just suggest it's about seeking neighbor shalom as one would normally seek shalom for oneself with that kind of intensity, with that kind of uh, resolve. It's about putting pursuit of neighbor shalom on a par with pursuit of your own shalom. And tying it all together, then we get a picture like this of, of the love in the love neighbor command in Jesus' teaching, it's, it's something like move by appreciation of your neighbors, anyone in need, in reach of your care, enormous worth as an image bearer of God. Seek her shalom, her sustenance, security, dignity, putting pursuit of these things for her on a par with pursuit of them for yourself. And now with this in mind, we can go back and ask, okay, so where did... Sam go wrong in his treatment of Marvin, and I want to suggest that where Sam went wrong was he was not putting Marvin's shalom on a par with his own. <clears throat> that infliction of violent harm on someone who seeks merely to meet his sustenance needs by honest work in order to protect one's own economic interests is a textbook case of not putting neighbor shalom on a par with one's own. That that's where Sam went wrong, that he um, uh, violently coerced Marvin, who posed no threat of violence against him, who merely was attempting to meet his sustenance needs by honest work, um, in service of 
Sam's own economic interests and those of his children. And uh, I want to suggest that that's a paradigmatic case of not putting neighbor shalom on a par with one's own. Now, um, uh, does this parable uh, carry over in the obvious way to the um, case of immigration? So let's see. Here's the parable retold with the, bits of, the obvious bits of it changed to apply to our immigration enforcement practices. So Marvin's crops have failed and his family is facing starvation. He drives 200 miles to the nearest U.S. town to sell his labor in the town's marketplace. Uncle Sam notices the stranger attempting to sell his labor and inquires about it. On learning that Marvin is an undocumented immigrant, Uncle Sam is upset. U.S. citizens sell their labor in the marketplace, and Uncle Sam is worried that Marvin's labor will lower the wages of his citizens and raise the cost of their social welfare programs. So he decides to act. Shotguns in hand, Uncle Sam's agents confiscate Marvin's furniture and detain him in an ICE detention center for several months before dropping him off thousands of miles away from his home. Marvin eventually makes it home to discover that his family has starved. Now, this kind of thing happens with um, uh, uh, shocking frequency uh, in our immigration enforcement practices. Each year, over 400,000 people, immigrants, asylum seekers, and in many cases, victims of human trafficking, are detained for months, sometimes years, and often less than humane conditions in immigration and customs enforcement detention centers. Um, in, in 2013 alone, uh, ICE records indicate that over 72,000 um, uh, deportees reported being separated from a U.S.-born child and enduring the pain of family separation, which uh, one can only imagine is incredibly intense. And then deportation, tens of thousands of deportees each year who find themselves, or, 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 uh, find themselves deported to countries which they left long ago in which they have no meaningful support system either don't speak the local language at all or speak it poorly and have no means of supporting themselves and suffer devastating consequences as a result, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, hunger, homelessness, etc. So there is a lot of violence visited by our immigration enforcement practices against immigration peoples. And now the question is, uh, how should we think about all of this from the perspective of the love command? Um, is, is there... Um, a parallel diagnosis of what we're doing as a people against immigration, uh, or rather uh, against immigrant peoples, um, uh, to the case of Sam and Marvin. Is there, is there, th does the obvious parallel hold there? Um, is there a moral difference between what we're doing and what Sam was doing in our first parable? And I want to suggest, it doesn't look like it to me. Infliction of violent harm on people who seek merely to meet their sustenance needs by honest work and pose no threat of violent harm to us in order to protect, to protect our own economic interests is a textbook case of our not putting these neighbors shalom on a par with our own. To treat them thus is to fail to love them as we love ourselves it's to wrong them. It, it, that's how it looks to me. It looks to me like the, the parallel between the two cases is fairly tight. Now, this is a complex topic uh, I, I um, want to emphasize. Uh, there are um, various objections one could raise, so let me briefly consider two. Um, um, although maybe I'll, I'll, I'll stop and... and, and um, state clearly my claim. So here's my claim. There are deep tensions between Jesus' love teachings and widespread immigration enforcement practices, and that this puts pressure on those of us who've given ourselves to following Jesus and his love teachings to stop supporting these practices and to work against them. That's the claim, and that's how it seems to me, but as I say, this is complicated. There are objections, so let me consider these two. First, uh, worries about terrorism. So we live in an age in which uh, there is uh, um, um, widespread dissemination of um, r radical uh, Islamic uh, and other kinds of terrorism. And this is a very real concern. And so you might worry that um, if we were to dramatically um, relax our immigration enforcement practices that we would run the risk of importing terrorism into our midst. 
There's also a, a very real worry about swamping, that if we were to dramatically relax our immigration enforcement practices and um, um, open up our borders, uh, allowing lots more immigrant peoples in, allow, allowing lots more refugee settlement in our midst, that it would put a kind of unsustainable pressure on governmental systems, uh, welfare systems, educational systems, medical systems, and so forth. And um, now there are empirical things to say in response. Um, historically, the number of refugees, for instance, that have um, come into the United States and run into trouble with the law uh, on issues related to terrorism has been minuscule. I mean, uh, just very, very few cases of this happening. And so you might wonder, um, is the level of violence we're visiting on immigration, or rather on immigrant people and, and refugees, um, is that proportionate to the danger we face from um, the importing of terrorism? You might wonder that. I don't, I, I don't propose to suggest one way or the other. Um, there's also the question of swamping. There are empirical questions about whether there are real dangers of swamping, and this is a subject of some disagreement among economists uh, who study these things. But, um, for instance, in the United States, where there is open uh, immigration, it hasn't been a case where uh, poorer parts of the country empty out and swamp the um, um, medical, uh, local governmental, uh, and educational systems of richer areas of, er areas of the country. That just hasn't happened. Um, there's also the fact that during the economic downturn of 08 and 09, uh, immigration virtually slowed to a halt because there were no jobs. Um, and so there's some reason to think that uh, immigration naturally balances itself out based on economic conditions, but not everybody um, thinks that's so. Some have raised real concerns about the possibility of swamping, so I don't want to minimize the, 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 the worry here. Um, so there are, are empirical things one might say in response to the terrorism. There are empirical points one might raise in response to worries about terrorism and swamping. Um, but I want to uh, raise a philosophical, um, uh, ethical response um, in the form of another parable. So see what you think. Uh, so here's the parable of Sam and the liver transplant. Ten people await liver transplant, nine of which will likely die before a liver becomes available. One is Sam's daughter. To increase her chances of survival, Sam forcibly detains the other nine in his basement until after his daughter has had the transplant. Several die in captivity. Now, most of us, I take it, would grant that Sam's behavior here is egregious, is morally abhorrent. Why? Well, again, different ethical um, frameworks will provide different answers. From the framework of a love ethic rooted in Jesus' love teachings and in the neighbor love command in particular, the, the diagnosis here is that um, Sam's treatment uh, of these nine people fails to love them as he's loving himself. Uh, infliction of violent harm on those who pose no threat of violence to anyone in order to secure some interest of one's own, even a vital interest, for example, a life-saving liver transplant for a loved one, is a textbook case of not putting these neighbors shalom on a par with one's own. It's a textbook case of failing to love these neighbors as one loves oneself. And now, uh, I want to suggest that it looks to me like something holds in the immigration case as well. Um, that in the immigration case, infliction of violent harm on immigrant peoples who seek merely to meet their sustenance needs by honest work and pose no threat of violence to anyone, right? I'm talking about those immigrant uh, peoples who come over who, who aren't ter who, and we're talking now about the vast, vast majority. They're not terrorists. They're not engaged in any kind of violent criminal activity. They're merely coming to work and provide for themselves. Um, infliction of violent harm on such peoples in order to, cure, to secure some interest of ours, even a vital interest, for example, safety against terrorism and, and the like, is a textbook case of not putting these neighbors shalom on a par with our own. It's to seek our shalom um, uh, with far more intensity than we're seeking theirs. Um, and it, again, it looks to me like um, just as Sam would wrong these nine other people to secure his daughter's opportunity for the liver transplant, I worry we are wronging uh, these many, many immigrant peoples to secure interests of our own, albeit vital interests. 
So in closing then, I suggest there are deep tensions between Jesus' love teachings and widespread immigration enforcement practices. Um, but I have to say, th these aren't going to change anytime soon. We, um, we now live in a uh, global geopolitical reality in which these kinds of immigration enforcement practices are the norm uh, across the nations, with very few exceptions. And so this is the political reality we live in. And what we Jesus followers need to think about, it seems to me, is what do we do in light of this political reality? Do we ignore it? Um, do we um, uh, speak out against it? Do we stand in love for uh, immigrant and refugee brothers and sisters who are being subjected to enormous uh, harm and suffering um, in the name of uh, our Lord? Thank you very much.